Nehmen Sie bitte Platz. Please take your seats. After the speech, we will also have an opportunity to applaud. And by the way, the Pope still has to travel from Berlin to Erfurt and Freiburg, and this should be taken into account here during the warm reception. Your Holiness, Excellenz, Federal President, Excellencies, members of the German Bundestag, the German government, the Bundesrat, distinguished guests. I would like to welcome you all very warmly to the German Bundestag, to which we have not for the first time invited an eminent guest. Yet, this is the first time in history that a Pope has spoken Parlament. to an elected German Parliament. Und selten and seldom hat in has a Haus speech in this House, even wurde, before its delivery, so attracted so much gefunden, attention and interest, in not only in hinaus. Germany, but also Sein far beyond. Vater in Holy Father, I would like to welcome you very warmly to Germany, your home country, and particularly to the German Bundestag. During the brief tenure of the last Pope from the German lands, Papstes, for fast 500 years, almost 500 years ago, gab es Deutschland Germany as, as a nation state had not yet been born. Das what existed was the Holy Reich, Roman Empire of the nation, German nation. An empire shaped by shifting dynasties, an empire which was as much or as little Roman as it was German, which by no means a nation and anything but holy. Germany is a country which was strongly molded by religion and religious wars for many centuries, including the Kulturkampf at the time of the foundation of the German Reich, a country whose Christian traditions of faith also influenced the constitution we have today. And had a central impact on the work of the fathers and mothers of the Constitution, who were, as the preamble says, conscious of their responsibility before God and man. Yet the understanding which we have today of basic rights, of the inviolability of human dignity and civil liberties, was also shaped by historical experiences and achievements, particularly the Enlightenment, which we have to thank not only for the challenge of faith by reason, but also for the separation of church and state, one of the indispensable elements of progress achieved by our civilization. I am fond of recalling the highly significant dialogue between Cardinal Ratzinger at the time prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and Jürgen Habermas. Together, they described and acknowledged faith and reason as the two great cultures of the West. Faith and reason. In the era of globalization, in a world shaken by war and crises, many people seek support and guidance. Upholding ethical principles, unswayed by markets and powers, and cultivating common values and beliefs is a major challenge, particularly for modern societies 
which seek to avoid endangering their internal cohesion. Deutschland, Germany, und Herren, ist ladies and gentlemen, is the country of the Reformation, which began here almost 500 years ago, with manifold consequences for, Kirche, for the Church, aber auch für Staat but und also state and society. Many people in Germany, not Katholiken only committed Catholics and Protestants, are vexed by the continuing division Ernst. of the churches. Auch deshalb, in part because they have sincere haben, doubts about whether the interconfessional differences, whilst they do undoubtedly exist, justify maintaining this division. And during the pontificate of a German pope, the first since the Reformation, they urgently wish to see not only a further declaration of commitment to ecumenism, but an unambiguous step towards overcoming the schism. Ihre Gespräche mit Vertretern Holy Father, your discussions with the representatives of other religions form a key element of your visit to Germany. The fact that your meeting with representatives of the Protestant Church is taking place in Erfurt, not at an arbitrary location, but at St. Augustine's monastery, is perceived and appreciated as a symbolic gesture, not only by many Christians, and gives cause for optimism that the 500th anniversary of the the Reformation in 2017 may be a collective expression of faith. Alongside your meetings with representatives of Islamic communities, you will also meet representatives of the Jewish community. The Reichstag building, ladies and gentlemen, where we have gathered today holds a pivotal place in German history. It stands for the rise and the fall of a parliamentary democracy. One of the main reasons for the failure was the lack of tolerance, the main victims of which were Germany's Jewish citizens. And it was Christians who looked the other way or took part, who vilified, persecuted, humiliated, and killed. For this reason, special symbolic importance, Holy Father, attaches to the fact that your meeting with representatives of Germany's growing Jewish community after your speech is taking place in this building, the seat of the freely elected parliament in reunified Germany which views itself as part of a Europe committed to shared values and beliefs. We are grateful for this opportunity to act as hosts. And we are committed to meeting the responsibility we bear for human dignity, freedom of religious and political belief, and tolerance towards different convictions and orientations. Inspired, as stated in the preamble of our Constitution, the basic law by the determination to promote world peace as an equal partner in a united Europe, and conscious of our responsibility before God and man. Conscious of this responsibility, Holy Father, we are happy that you are visiting us and we look forward to your speech.
Mr. President of the Federal Republic, Mr. President of the Bundestag, Madam Chancellor, Mr. President of the Bundesrat, ladies and gentlemen, members of the House, it is an honor and a joy for me to speak before this distinguished House, before the Parliament of my native Germany that meets here as a democratically elected representation of the people in order to work for the good of the Federal Republic of Germany. I should like to thank the President of the Bundestag both for his invitation to deliver this address and for the kind words of greeting and appreciation with which he has welcomed me. At this moment, I turn to you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, not least as your fellow countryman, who, for all his life, has been conscious of close links to his origins and has followed the affairs of his native Germany with keen interest. But the invitation to the, give this address was extended to me as Pope, as the Bishop of Rome, who bears the highest responsibility for Catholic Christianity. In issuing this invitation, you are acknowledging the role that the Holy See plays as a partner within the community of peoples and states. Setting out from this international responsibility that I hold, I should like to propose to you some thoughts on the foundations of a free state of law. Allow me to begin my reflections on the foundations of law with a brief story from sacred scripture. In the first book of the Kings, it is recounted that God invited the young King Solomon on his accession to the throne to make a request. What will the young ruler ask for at this important moment? Success, wealth, long life, destruction of his enemies? He chooses none of these things. Instead, he asks for a listening heart so that he may govern God's people and discern between good and evil. Through this story, the Bible wants to tell us what should ultimately matter for a politician. His fundamental criterion and the motivation for his work as a politician must not be success and certainly not material gain. Politics must be a striving for justice, and hence it has to establish the fundamental preconditions for peace. Naturally, a politician will seek success, as this is what opens up for him the possibility of effective political action. Yet, success is subordinated to the criterion of justice, to the will to do what is right, and to the understanding of what is right. Success can also be seductive, and can thus open up the path towards the falsification of what is right, towards the destruction of justice. Without justice, what else is the state but a great band of robbers, as St. Augustine once said. We Germans know from our own experience that these words are no empty specter. We have seen how power became divorced from right, how power opposed right and crushed it so that the state became an instrument for destroying right, a highly organized band of robbers, capable of threatening the whole world and driving it to the edge of the abyss. To serve right and to fight against the dominion of wrong is and remains the, fundal task, the fundamental task of the politician. At a moment in history when man has acquired previously inconceivable power, this task takes on a particular urgency. Man can destroy the world. He can manipulate himself. He can, so to speak, make human beings and he can deny them their humanity. How do we recognize what is right? How can we discern between good and evil, between what is truly right and what may appear right? Even now, Solomon's request remains the decisive issue facing politicians and politics today. For most of the matters that need to be regulated by law, the support of the majority can serve as a sufficient criterion. 
Yet it is evident that for the fundamental issues of law, in which the dignity of man and of humanity is at stake, the majority principle is not enough. Everyone in a position of responsibility must personally seek out the criteria to be followed when framing laws. In the third century, the great theologian Origen provided the following explanation for the resistance of Christians to certain legal systems. Suppose, he wrote, that a man were living among the Scythians, whose laws are contrary to the divine law, and was compelled to live among them. Such a man, for the sake of the true law, though illegal among the Scythians, would rightly form associations with like-minded people contrary to the laws of the Scythians. This conviction was what motivated, what motivated resistance movements to act against the Nazi regime and other totalitarian regimes, thereby doing a great service to justice and to humanity as a whole. For these people, it was indisputably evident that the law in force was actually unlawful. Yet when it comes to the decisions of a democratic politician, the question of what now corresponds to the law of truth, what is actually right and may be enacted as law, is less obvious. In terms of the underlying anthropological issues, what is right and may be given the force of law is in no way simply self-evident today. The question of how to recognize what is truly right and thus to serve justice when framing laws has never been simple. And today, in the vast extent of our knowledge and our capacity, it has become still harder. How do we recognize what is right? In history, systems of law have almost always been based on religion. Decisions regarding what was to be lawful among men were taken with reference to the divinity. Unlike other great religions, Christianity has never proposed a revealed body of law to the state and to society. That is to say, a juridical order derived from revelation. Instead, it has pointed to nature and reason as the true sources of law, and to the harmony of objective and subjective reason, which naturally presupposes that both spheres are rooted in the creative reason of God. Christian theologians thereby aligned themselves with a philosophical and juridical movement that began to take shape in the second century BC. In the first half of that century, the social, natural law developed by the Stoic philosophers came into contact with leading teachers of Roman law. Through this encounter, the juridical culture of the West was born, which was and is of key significance for the juridical culture of mankind. This pre-Christian marriage between law and philosophy opened up the path that led via the Christian Middle Ages and the juridical developments of the Age of Enlightenment all the way to the Declaration of Human Rights and to our German basic law of 1949, with which our nation committed itself to the inviolable and inalienable human rights as the foundation of every human community and of peace and justice in the world. For the development of law and for the development of humanity, it was highly significant that Christian theologians aligned themselves against the religious law associated with polytheism and on the side of philosophy, and that they acknowledged reason and nature in their interrelation as the universally valid source of law. This step had already been taken by St. Paul in the letter to the Romans when he said, when Gentiles who have not the law, the Torah of Israel, do, what the, do by nature what the law requires, then they are law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. 
Here we see the two fundamental concepts of nature and conscience, where conscience is nothing other than Solomon's listening heart, reason that is open to the language of being. If this seemed to offer a clear explanation of the foundations of legislation up to the time of the Enlightenment, up to the time of the Declaration of Human Rights after the Second World War and the framing of our basic law, there has been a dramatic shift in the situation in the last half century. The idea of a natural law is today viewed as a specifically Catholic doctrine, not worth bringing into the discussion in a non-Catholic environment, so that one feels almost ashamed even to mention the term. Let me outline briefly how this situation arose. Fundamentally, it is because of the idea that an unbridgeable gulf exists between is and ought. An ought can never follow from an is, because the two are situated on completely different planes. The reason for this is that in the meantime, the positivist understanding of nature and reason has come to be almost universally accepted. If nature, in the words of Hans Kelsen, is viewed as an aggregate of objective data linked together, in terms of cause and effect, then indeed no ethical indication of any kind can be derived from it. A positivist conception of nature as purely functional, in the way that the natural sciences explain it, is incapable of producing any bridge to ethics and law, but once again yields only functional answers. The same applies to reason, according to a positive positivist understanding that is widely held to be the only genuinely scientific one. Anything that is not verifiable or falsifiable, according to this understanding, does not belong to the realm of reason strictly understood. Hence, ethics and religion must be assigned to the subjective field, and they remain extraneous to the realm of reason in the strict sense of the word, where positivist reason dominates the field to the exclusion of all else and that is broadly the case in our public mindset, then the classical sources of knowledge for ethics and law are excluded. This is a dramatic situation which affects everyone and on which a public debate is necessary. Indeed, an essential goal of this address is to issue an urgent invitation to launch one. The positivist approach to nature and reason, the positivist view of the world in general, is a most important dimension of human knowledge and capacity that we may in no way dispense with. But in and of itself, it is not a sufficient culture corresponding to the full breadth of the human condition. Where positivist reason considers itself the only sufficient culture and banishes all other cultural realities to the status of subcultures, it diminishes man. Indeed, it threatens his humanity. I say this with Europe specifically in mind, where there are concerted efforts to recognize only positivism as a common culture and a common basis for lawmaking, so that all the other insights and values of our culture are reduced to the level of subculture, with the result that Europe, vis-à-vis -vis other world cultures, is left in a state of culturelessness, and at the same time, extremist and radical movements emerge to fill the vacuum. In its self-proclaimed exclusivity, the positivist reason, which recognizes nothing beyond mere functionality, resembles a concrete bunker with no windows, in which we ourselves provide lighting and atmospheric conditions, being no longer willing to obtain either from God's wide world. And yet we cannot hide from ourselves the fact that even in this artificial world we are still covertly drawing upon God's raw materials which we refashion into our own products. The windows must be flung open again. We must see the wide world, the sky and the earth once more and learn to make proper use of all this. 
But how are we to do this? How do we find our way into the wide world, into the big picture? How can reason rediscover its greatness without being sidetracked into irrationality? How can nature reassert itself in its true depth, with all its demands, with all its directives? I would like to recall one of the developments in recent political history, hoping that I will neither be misunderstood nor provoke too many one-sided polemics. I would say that the emergence of the ecological movement in German politics since the 1970s, while it has not exactly flung open the windows, nevertheless was and continues to be a cry for fresh air which must not be ignored or pushed aside just because too much of it is seen to be irrational. Young people had come to realize that something is wrong in our relationship with nature, that matter is not just raw material for us to shape at will, but that the earth has a dignity of its own and that we must follow its directives. In saying this, I am clearly not promoting any particular political party. Nothing could be further from my mind. If something is wrong in our relationship with reality, then we must all reflect seriously on the whole situation, and we are all prompted to question the very foundations of our culture. Allow me to dwell a little longer on this point. The importance of ecology is no longer disputed. We must listen to the language of nature and we must answer accordingly. Yet I would like to underline a further point that is still largely disregarded today as in the past. There is also an ecology of man. Man too has a nature that he must respect and that he cannot manipulate at will. Man is not merely self-creating freedom. Man does not create himself. He is intellect and will. He is intellect and will, but he is also nature. And his will is rightly ordered if he listens to his nature respects it and accepts himself for who he is, as one who did not create himself. In this way and in no other is true human freedom fulfilled. Let us come back to the fundamental concepts of nature and reason from which we set out. The great proponent of legal positivism, Kelsen, at the age of 84 in 1965, abandoned the dualism of is and ought. And it provides some consolation to me that you can have reasonable thoughts at the age of 84. He had said that norms can only come from the will. Nature, therefore, could only contain norms, says Kelsen, if a will had put these norms there. But this he says, would presuppose a creator God whose will had entered into nature. Any attempt to discuss the truth of this belief is utterly futile, he observed. Is it really, I find myself asking, is it really pointless to wonder whether the objective reason that manifests itself in nature does not presuppose a creative reason? a creator spiritus? At this point, Europe's cultural heritage ought to come to our assistance. The conviction that there is a creator God is what gave rise to the idea of human rights, the idea of the equality of all people before the law, the recognition of the inviolability of human dignity in every single person, and the awareness of people's responsibility for their actions. Our cultural memory is shaped by these rational insights. To ignore it, or to dismiss it as a thing of the past, would be to dismember our culture 
totally and to rob it of its completeness. The culture of Europe arose from the encounter between Jerusalem, Athens and Rome, from the encounter between Israel's monotheism, the philosophical reason of the Greeks and Roman law. This three-way encounter has shaped the inner identity of Europe. In the awareness of man's responsibility before God and in the acknowledgement of the inviolable dignity of every single human person, it has established criteria of law. It is these criteria that we are called to defend at this moment in our history. As he assumed the mantle of office, the young King Solomon was invited to make a request. How would it be if we, the lawmakers of today, were invited to make a request? What would we ask for? I think that even today there is ultimately nothing else we could wish for but a listening heart, the capacity to discern between good and evil, and thus to establish true law to serve justice and peace. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Holy Father, wholeheartedly for having accepted our invitation and having addressed us. Your speech is an important contribution to a necessary, broad public debate with the ethical underpinnings and the spiritual guidance for a free society and a democracy defined by the rule of law. You just described the wide world between heaven and earth. And the dialogue between cultures, religions is necessary. It is often called for, but usually or seldom put into practice. So thank you for your speech, again, Holy Father, and best wishes for your demanding and strenuous visit to Germany in the next few days. I have some housekeeping remarks at the end for all those who registered for the service in the Olympic Stadium immediately following this event. 
buses will depart from Paul Löberhaus to the Olympic Stadium. The meeting is closed.